Hello, friends. Dave Robinson from the Andre Media Lake Network coming to you live from the action center, the nerve center, the pulse beat of Game Hole Con. And one of the astonishing things about this event is that you literally cannot swing a dead cat without hitting a stellar luminary of the Ow. game business. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and Matt Forback was recently smacked by a dead cat uh, and consented to spend just a little bit of time with us talking about uh, 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 gaming and storytelling. Thank you okay. so much, Matt. I Thanks appreciate for having it. Thanks Dave. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So, Matt, um, if you're not familiar with this person, you clearly aren't on Twitter and you're not in the gaming scene. Um, specifically coming out very, very shortly, I think on the 8th, Dungeonology. Yeah, actually, it's already out in the United States. They bumped it forward a couple weeks. Didn't even tell me about it, but now it's out. <laughs> of course. So, uh, there's a friend of mine here, Brian Winter, who runs uh, I'm Board Games here in yes, Minnesota. Yes, yes. And he's got, he says, four dozen copies here at the show for people. Really? Yeah. Dudes, if you're not making the scene, there's one incentive right there. Uh, Dungeonology, Volos... Yep. Secrets, insights into the forgotten realms. Yeah, I actually write the book as uh, Volo Thamp Gedarm, who's uh, the guy who did all the Volo's guides to the Sword Coast and whatever else in the forgotten realms. And then Ed Greenwood actually writes an introduction to it as Elminster. It comes as a little uh, letter from Elminster saying, don't listen to Volo, he's an idiot, right? Because <laughs> Elminster would know. Of course. After yeah, all. Yeah. And of Very course, cool. Volo is an idiot. But you know, it's, it's all good fun. <laughs> and that's part of the reason why yeah. you buy and exactly. read. Absolutely. Um, Matt, given your background of working with licensed properties, working with fiction, and working with gaming, there are these are very distinct storytelling frameworks and modalities. You work very gracefully in both of them, and it seems like you have a gift for translating one to the other. And that intersection of role-playing game storytelling and fiction storytelling is a fascinating place. You're, you're kind of like the priest <laughs> who, who intercedes on the behalf of the, the yes, Dominus Ex Patri, uh, from role-playing to fiction and back again. I wanted to explore that process with you. How, when, when starting, let's start with gaming into fiction. Sure. How do you identify the thematic elements and the character elements and the storytelling aspects of a game environment mm -hmm. and translate that into an effective fiction experience. Well, I think one of the neat things about games, especially if you're talking role-playing games, is that they, they have all those elements there to begin with, right? right? I mean, the game designer or the writers of the, of the role-playing game have already gone to the trouble of building that entire world out for you in excruciating detail sometimes, right? <laughs> True. Um, and you know, a lot of it's stuff that you would never use in a, in a book, right? You don't really need to know how many coppers translate into silvers, translate to platinum, translate to electrum, whatever. But it's nice to have that information there for you because it actually gives a uh, depth of uh, versimilitude to the entire world, right? And a writer can tap into that and say, well, I didn't have to come up with all this stuff. Or maybe you did if you're the same person. Well, right, yeah, right? in your case. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, I have this information here, and that becomes then the, the iceberg. You know, as a storyteller, you're only showing the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. But there's all that huge mass of it, 90% of it, that sits under the water that supports everything, right? right. And without that, the 90% the, the or whatever, that 10% uh, you have, would just sink straight to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And if you have that kind of a foundation behind it, that brings everything up and allows it to stab out of the water and get you right in the eye, hopefully. But isn't there a, a danger of including too much? Oh yeah, definitely. How do you draw that line? When, when do you know that you've crossed that line of, okay, nobody needs to know how many coppers are in a silver piece and I'm telling them here in paragraph six. But I think the idea is that you shouldn't tell them anything they don't need to know for the story you're telling at the moment. Okay. Right. If it's something where you're just showing off about how clever you are and how, uh, how much detail you've gone into <laughs> and how cool it is that it works like this as opposed to this, that's not good. Then you, if people can hear dice rolling in the background, <laughs> that is a telltale thing. But you know, honestly, if you have something you want to show off, you could do that. But you have to come up with a story-specific reason to show that part of the game off. Okay. Right? Otherwise, why is it there? Right? Otherwise, it's just window dressing and it doesn't mean anything to the story itself. The story has always got to be the most important thing when you're telling a story. When you're playing a game, the game is the most important thing. Right. And story can get out of the way. But when you're doing a story, that has to be primary. That raises an interesting point. Um, for game design, in your experience, if you're creating an adventure, for gamers, you are at a profound disadvantage because, damn, <laughs> moffers. <laughs> yes, the, the live action people are going at it right next door. Um, you don't know who the protagonist is of the story you're trying to present. How do you craft an adventure 
that's open-ended enough that any protagonist can fit into it, but still compelling enough so that that protagonist wants to be there. Well, that's a challenging thing. It's, it's uh, You have no idea who the players are going to be, right? And you don't have any idea what their ambitions are going to be, what the Game Master might do to it. Fortunately, you have somebody on your side at all times, right? The Game Master is going to take whatever I wrote as a game developer and then translate that into something that fits best with their group, right? So that Game Master is going to know their players better than I ever could, right. and they're going to know what their own ambitions are for the story better than I ever could. And I rely on them to translate that stuff specifically to that group, right? Now, that means as I'm doing things, I need to make sure that nothing I do hangs upon anything particularly having to do with the characters. Mm -hmm. It has to be something that can stand independent of the characters entirely. And that way, uh, there are plenty of hooks that you can put in there that the Game Master can grab onto, but none of them is essential. And none of them says, well, if you don't have a cleric in the party, you're screwed, right? right? Anything like that. Because then you are screwed. Then the game doesn't work for those people or that particular group. And you need to make it generic enough, but still compelling enough at the same time. And that's that everybody can enjoy it. Right? Yeah, definitely. Because you, you've got, you, you can only, you can't, feed everybody. You cannot no. provide everything. So your goal then is to appeal to the broadest sector and basically, so just to talk back, sure. you're, you're using, you're not marketing necessarily to the game, to the players, but to the game master. You're, Definitely. You're, they're your partner. You give them the tools that allow them to do their job yep. and let them be the storyteller. No, the game master takes the ball across the, the, the goal line essentially, right? The, uh, Sports metaphors for the win, guys. Holy yeah, crap. We're in Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> go, go Badgers. <laughs> <laughs> go Packers, all of that. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, I think that you have to rely on the Game Master to be able to do that stuff. And actually, the Game Master, if you're being crass from a commercial point of view, that's your market, right? The players right. are not buying this stuff. They're never going to read this stuff, probably, right? Except maybe after the adventure's over. Right. The, the Game Master is the one that has to be intrigued by it, thinks it's cool enough to actually play with his or her party, and then actually breathes life into it and makes a game out of it. What I'm providing is just a framework for them, right? Just a skeleton. They're going to drop the flesh in it. One of the ways I tend to do that, though, is I had a lot of my adventures, a lot of my stories even, will involve mysteries and intrigue, right? Okay. And that way, uh, that's something that tends to be universal. You say, who killed this person, or what's going on here, or who kidnapped that, or, or uh, what happened to this MacGuffin that's gone over here, you know, the Maltese Falcon, whatever you want to call it. And that's something that everybody can relate to, no matter who they're playing in the game. Interesting. Right? It yeah. doesn't have to be, you killed my father. Right? <laughs> Prepared or, to die. Or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it just has to be something that's generic, that is intriguing enough. You know, like if you hear a crying child in the distance, that's something most people will respond to, no right. matter who they are. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's the kind of thing you can use to hook people in without having to worry about who they are. That's excellent. And, and if you have their, their passion and their commitment to find the answer to that mystery, then it's very easy to bring in the character right. hooks that will make them engage more, more effectively with right. the story. Let's look at it from the other perspective now. Sure. Let's look at it from fiction into gaming. Okay. That translation is very different because you have a very internal subjective experience with right. persons, people reading stories, and then you have to pull that out, quantify it in some way, and then package it into a game experience. How does that work for you? Well, I think it's different because as we were just talking about when, uh, with uh, with writing for games, when you're writing a game, you have to do the story arc, really, the plot arc and everything else. But you don't have to worry about the character arcs. Right? Right. The characters take care of that. The players take care of that. They do that. When you're doing writing, you have to think about the character arcs because characters are often the most compelling thing about a story. Right? Always. There's what brings you into it and, and uh, draws you along. And if it's a great character, the story can be subpar, you know, but if it's a, vice versa, if it's a great story, the character can be kind of generic. Ideally, you have wonderful things on both sides, right? right. But when you're doing it as a writer uh, for a story, you have to make sure the, the story arc is fantastic and the character arc is compelling at the same time and that they weave together, that there's a reason for this character to be in this story as opposed to somebody else. So all those points I was saying before about how you need to make it more generic for a game, you need to whittle those away and make it more personal for a story. Okay. And then translating that into the game environment is, well, you're not going to pull out the arc no. of the character per se, but again, because of the generis genericization, I'm making sure, shit sure. up as we go. That's a good neologism. <laughs> the genericization of the story components when you move into the game environment, there's a, there's a danger there of losing that compelling hook that made the story so effective. How do you prevent, I guess, what are the warning signs that you've stepped too far back 
in your gaming development? Well, I think if, if uh, the storyline hooks entirely around the character, then you need to step back and say, what is it about this situation that, they're in, that can speak to anybody and then focus on those, okay. right? And not every story is going to make a good game. No, no, exactly. Okay. I, mean, I think there are a lot of ways to translate things across, I think, but, you know, it's it's dull to actually just write out, uh, I wouldn't want to transcribe a game I was sitting down at with people, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many other things going on in a game that don't have anything to do with the story. Writers be take dull to transcribe this, it all. That's good advice. Right? Yes. So, uh, in that sense, I think it, it's not, nothing is really a translation back and forth. Whenever I translate things between different media, I do a lot of different media. I do computer games and toys and, and stories and, and video comic games. Books. Or, comic books. Lots of different things. Encyclopedias. Um, the whole idea is that you want to figure out what's core in this that people, that resonates with people. Right? What is it about this that the fans respond to? What is it that makes them love this thing? Right? And then if you can figure out what that core bit is, then you can try to translate that bit over to the other places. But you need to be respectful of each medium or each medium, right? Because every medium has its own strengths and, and uh, weaknesses. You know, something, you know, novels are really good at getting into a character's head, for instance. Film is not, no. right? <laughs> a comic books are not. Uh, Dune, we're looking at you. Exactly. So, uh, you know, if it's something that's cerebral that really is, gets into the emotions of the character, a lot of times you want to see that on a page because you can really get deep into it. But if it's something that's really flashy, action-oriented, uh, it depends more on visuals mm -hmm. than on internal dialogue, then that would be a film or a comic book or something like that that's more visual, right? right? And a, a game, particularly, if it's something that relies on tricky mechanics and thinking about how to work things in different ways, that might make a really good mystery, but it also make a really good game, right? And you need to that. figure out you know, how to link those two together. And again, I think that's one of the reasons I tend to lean on mystery when I do a lot of this stuff, because that's something that has moving parts in it, just like a game does. Sure, right? and it's universal in terms of that appeal. Exactly. That makes perfect sense. What do you see, and this is, just, this is one of those questions, and I apologize. Sure. Things are changing dramatically in, in the terrain of storytelling sure. with, with internet, e-media, the evolution of gaming, the, the introduction of video and interactive experiences. True Dungeon yeah. is here. Did Holy it last crap. night, fantastic. Oh, <laughs> man. What do you see, what are you looking forward to as an evolution of storytelling? Well, I think it's, it, there's just so many different ways to do it. I mean, I love the, the traditional ways. I love, you know, from sitting around a campfire to telling jokes in a bar to writing down a story to whatever. I think one of the coolest things that we got coming is going to be virtual reality and also on top of that is augmented reality, right? right. The kind of stuff they're doing with the Microsoft HoloLens where, uh, or even with Pokemon Go, sure. where you have things that are going on in your environment but also are happening on a screen with you at the same time or across your eyes that are overlaid on the environment. Some amazing things we'll be able to do with that. I mean, the things that people are doing in virtual reality storytelling, even with forking, branching virtual reality storytelling, are fantastic, right? I, uh, a woman I was down with, uh, they had this conference called Sto Forward Story down in Costa Rica I was with uh, down in the spring. A woman named Karen was doing this stuff like as a, it's almost like an Assassin's Creed thing where you're running across rooftops and uh, and you know trying to avoid different things. And then you had different choices you could make in the middle of, of this film that okay. she was making. Okay. You know, that's really cutting edge stuff. Yeah. And it, then she's putting it on goggles on people as they're doing it, right? <laughs> so you're doing it through VR goggles. Just stunning stuff. And, you know, this is probably not going to be Pulitzer Prize winning stuff at this point, but this is like when we started doing films and you saw the train coming at people and they all ran out of the theater. Sure, right. right. And we're getting to that point where we're just developing the vocabulary to talk about these things properly. And then once we get that down, we're going to be starting to build on that and just coming up with things that we can barely imagine right now. Yeah, the, 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 the elements of storytelling are growing. Exactly. And, and the way they intersect, the way they fit, and the reaction they evoke in the readers is something we just don't know yet. I and mean, that's gonna be that's gonna be the next decade of exploration for storytellers. Exactly. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Matt, thank you so much. This is a real it. pleasure. It. Guys, this is just the first of many interviews coming at you from GameholeCon. Thanks so much for tuning in. We will be back with more later.